Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Stephanie Cristello. I'm the Director of Programming at Expo Chicago and the Editor-in-Chief of The Scene, Chicago's International Journal for Contemporary and Modern Art. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to Dialogues today, which is presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dialogues is a year-round program of panels and symposia which culminates during the exposition, featuring leading artists, curators, and professionals on the current issues that engage them. Today's panel is presented in conjunction with the exposition that we co-programmed with the Palais de Tokyo entitled Singing Stones, which was curated by Catel Jaffray and takes place at the Roundhouse at the DuSable Museum of African American History. The exhibition will be on view through October 29. Today we'll be presenting this panel also in partnership with the Smart Museum of Art, so thank you to Michael Cristiano and the Smart Museum for all of the work that you did in helping us put together this discussion. The panel will be moderated by Ali Gass, who's the Dana Faitler Director of the Smart Museum. Before her appointment just a few months ago, Gass was previously the Chief Curator and Associate Director for exhibitions and collections at the Cantor Art Center at Stanford University since 2014. Prior to that, she was a member of the leadership team that opened the Eli and Edith Brown Museum at Michigan State University, including serving as the museum's acting director. Today, she'll be in conversation with Bushra Khalili and Colleen Smith, who's represented by Corbett versus Dempsey. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. I'm Ali Gass. Um, this is going to be a really interesting, I think, and fun panel in the sense that the three of us have actually never really met before, nor have we talked that much. So you get this kind of wonderful moment of really seeing for the first time a conversation that is unscripted in every way, but I think will circulate around topics that we're all really, really interested in. So before I start, I have the distinct honor of giving you a little bio for each of these terrific and very special artists, artists who I, I have admired for a long time, and I'm quite grateful to have a chance to sit here with them. Um, Bouchra Khalili is a Moroccan-French artist born in Casablanca. She later studied film at Sorbonne Nouvelle and visual arts at the École Nationale Supérieure de Arts de Paris-Sergie, sort of. She lives and works in Berlin and Oslo, although, as I've just learned, has a Radcliffe Fellowship and is spending the year at Harvard. Um, she works across a variety of media in film, video installation, photography, and prints. She has shown her work all over the world notably with the Mapping Journey Project solo exhibition at MoMA in 2016, a really spectacular work as well at this Documenta, um, Palais de Tokyo show in Paris in 2015, and many, many, many more. So I'm incredibly honored to have you here today. Colleen Smith, perhaps some of you know her a little bit better. She's lived in Chicago for what I understand is the last several years. Um, Colleen Smith was born in Riverside, California. She's an interdisciplinary artist whose work reflects upon the everyday possibilities of the imagination, which is a fantastic phrase. Um, operating in multiple materials and arenas, she roots her work firmly within the discourse of mid-20th century experimental film, drawing from structuralism, third world cinema, and science fiction. She too has shown broadly around the world um, most recently featured in group exhibitions at the Studio Museum of Harlem, the Houston Contemporary Art Museum, the Everbuena Center for Art, and the New Museum. Um, she has had an installation at the Kitchen, and a Jessica, uh, solo exhibition at the Foundation for Contemporary Arts, the Chicago Expo Arcadia Award was awarded to her, and she's had a Rauschenberg residency. So thank you both so, so much for being here. Um, when I thought about what it meant for us to kind of sit here together and talk for the first time, I thought a little bit about my own background and my own career as a curator of contemporary art, which has really largely been committed to kind of, I keep getting these job titles that are asking me to really think about our global condition through the lens of artistic practice and kind of think about 
how do we learn and understand the world around us through artists. And I think in our world of many biennials and art fairs and curators like me who try to think and partner as globally as possible, the issues around place and nationalism and artistic movement often come to the forefront. And I've kind of had this idea for a long time of an exhibition that I always sort of wanted to do but always didn't do, um, which I wanted to call Does Place Matter? Thinking about, you know, we tend to fixate so much on where perhaps an artist is from or who their cohort of collaborators is or the ways that we might read work based upon an understanding of what we think we know about that, that biography or that nationalism or that place. Um, in many ways, the exhibition at the Palais de Tokyo starts from a notion of place. We're partnering French artists with Chicago artists. We're doing it in Chicago in a very unique and particular architectural setting. So I wanted to really spend our time together thinking about the value of looking at place in terms of the way it might or might not actually influence work, actually effectively influence a reading or a response to work, and at what point should we throw it out as not necessary, and thinking about things like place as mundane as the fact that Colleen is leaving Chicago and moving to LA, and there's been some writing and thinking about mourning about that, or more serious topics that all of us deal with about the subject matters in works about people who are forced to leave a place, or people whose lives are very complicated because of the place that they're in. And to me, these feel like some of the most urgent topics we could be talking about in the world right now. So I thought I might start by asking each of you to think about, before we get into how place does or doesn't impact the work, or the work is about places and things that happen there, how complicated of a question is it for you, for someone to ask you, where are you from? <laughs> is it a complicated question at all? I'll turn to you, Bushra. <laughs> um, well, I'm often asked the question, yes. uh, but I keep answering that I'm from Casablanca. Yeah. Um, and it's quite, um, I mean, I like referring to the fact that I am from Casablanca also because of the history of the representation of the city mm -hmm. that has actually nothing to do with the city itself. Yes. So I come from a place that exists in imagination, yes. uh, in specific representation, uh, shaped by the West, by yes. the way. Uh, but the place I come from is completely different because it's also within the um, Moroccan history, mm -hmm. uh, a place that was made and constructed and developed by migrants. Yes. from all over the country. Uh, even though the, the story of the city is very much related to the colonial history, mm -hmm. because it was before an invention of the colonial power, of the French colonial regime. But it was completely appropriated by the people who moved to Casablanca throughout the 20th century, literally from all over the country. Right. So I come from a place that has this dual and opposition and, uh, and very conflicted story of being a sort of contested legacy of the colonial history, and at the same time, the side from where the resistance also organized against the colonial regime. So that's why I often answer, I'm from Casablanca. <laughs> yes, and that is such a beautiful answer to that question, and I think the ideas that I had talked about in my Does Place Matter was, what are the assumptions we have about a place, because we hear a constructed version of that, versus what is the reality of the lived daily life there? So I think that is sort of a perfect answer in many ways. All right, is it hard for you to say where are you from? No. It's, it's amusing though because if you, I grew up in California so it's a, it's a place upon which a great deal is projected and a place where projections are the site from which they're produced and these images that you're talking about like the, I mean the moment you say you're from Casablanca I have like a very very, it's like a strong trigger about what that means and doesn't mean actually run into, you know what I mean? So I'm from a place that uh, when you leave California, the first thing people want to know is what's it like there, as if you can't actually go there and visit right. it. <laughs> or as if there's like a singular experience of being Yeah, there. but in, in some ways it's true. Like it, there is this other part of California that you can't actually ever visit <laughs> yeah. because it doesn't exist. It's a projection. 
Um, and so, I, I, I mean, I, I'm like endlessly fascinated with the way that functions as a strange kind of currency within the U.S. or in North America. I'm just being from that particular state. I agree with that. Having just moved here three months ago from California <laughs> myself, um, and it's a hard question for me, frankly, these days when people ask me where I'm from yeah. for different reasons. Um, but just going back to you, Colleen, I think so much gets talked about just from my very outside perspective of you being a Chicago-based mm -hmm. artist. But the answer to your question is that you're from California. Mm -hmm. Has have you? How is that kind of sliding between a, a place identities? worked in, or have, has it worked for you? Oh, well, you know, I mean, I, I love the city of Chicago, and I this is a city that I've chosen to live in, whereas I've lived in many other cities, Austin and Boston and San Diego, and, and those are places that I went to live in to work because I needed work. Um, and I spent, I did five years in Chicago unemployed, so I must really like it here. Right. <laughs> um, uh, and I think, I think, you know, and I, and I just literally yesterday got back from spending a lot of time in Toronto. And I think North America is like the vastness of it as a continent makes it so that um, any place that you land is its, is, is its own it's a very specific yeah. kind of uh, territory, both like in the imagination and in, in place. And you always have to ask, crucially have to ask, whose land am I on? Yeah. Which is like a, something I'm just, I'm just learning how to do. And um, so Chicago is, is special because uh, somehow it's such a messy place that there's like just a great deal of, of room and, and there's a great deal of sort of like histories and meta histories and um, for me just food in terms of like how do you build ideas or speculations about what's possible or how do you understand what's happening in the world right now. This city, because it's so fractured in such a mess, so this kind of offers the space to do that. To really think about the real challenges we have about talking about who belongs where and how, and it's complicated. Um, for either, or for both of you, as you make choices to make art, are there moments in your career that you can point to the place you live really truly informing the practice, or the people you're around in that place really truly informing the practice? I think Colleen, you were talking about a little bit with Chicago. Can you, do you want to talk a little bit more about maybe how your work has been touched? You know touched? what, I, this, is, yeah. this is a little ass regret. I'm sorry, but I'm actually, that was my question for you. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> like watching the piece that's at the DuSable Museum. Yeah. What's the title of that piece? Uh, living Labor. Yes, and Living Labor. Maybe okay. we should stop for a sec and let each of you talk about the piece that you're showing at the DuSable, since people haven't. Maybe perhaps seen it. Let's do your question, and then we'll do that. Well, I can, I'll describe her film for her. You describe her film for her. Perfect. I have a question about and it. If I disagree, yeah. I wouldn't tell it. Yes. <laughs> well, this could get really good now. Okay. Um, uh, so the film is um, like a kind of portraiture cinema in which individuals are speaking about their experience of working as an immigrant, as an undocumented laborer in the United States, what it meant to come to the United States, what it is like to be a kind of labor and commodity in a country where you're just completely silenced and invisible. And each individual, it seems as if, I, you, like, it seems as if they've written their speeches and then memorized them. Like they wrote out something that they wanted to say but they recite it to you, to, to the camera. Even when they're not looking at the camera, it's for us. It's something they want us to know. Um, and, and it's shot in New York. And I, I, mean, I was like, well, I know that Boutre's from Morocco, so yeah. like, the, process of, the process of finding these individuals for me was really intriguing because there was a kind of intimacy in terms of um, the specificity of these individuals, because they were all very woke, as we would say. They were very conscious of the of the of their position in the world and understood the entire system in which they're participating in, each one of them. And I, and it was just so exciting to actually have that articulated and examined. And and then I was just wondering why it had why why it is and how it is that you found your way there and to them in that city and how that happened. Did I, did I do okay though? Did I, just I didn't interrupt. So I, it was that was really good actually. <laughs> <laughs> I 
and get quite uh, Absolutely, and a beautiful question, and I think a very important question. Um, because it's also connected to the one you were uh, asking Colin about. Um, I spent more than six months in New York for that piece, and at the same time, as someone who has been living in Berlin for already a few years, um, it's quite strange the connection I have with my own project because they always pre-exist years before. I finally had the opportunity to produce them, yes. So I, I, I have a sort of um, place in my mind where all those projects are located and then suddenly it, it becomes possible. So when I started working on the speeches series to which Living Labour uh, uh, belongs to, it's made of three different films shot in three different locations, one being Paris and its suburbs, and the banlieue where I lived. So this one was actually strongly connected to a place where I lived for several years. But the others was produced in Genoa, Italy, and the third in New York. Uh, but even the geography of the project itself uh, had a meaning, because it started with a place that I knew, and where I was myself uh, living as an immigrant with a residency permit, years before I eventually became a French citizen. Um, and in a uh, urban structure I knew very well and among people that I also knew very well not all of them personally but um, I was part of uh, those kind of communities but the shift to Italy was also important because it was also the way how I could connect what you described as a sort of method uh, to its maybe deep inspiration that is uh, for me the, the conception of the civic poet in uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini's writing. Uh, I know here it means something different, but in Italy it has a very specific history that is actually linked to nationalism, because they had to invent a narrative uh, to um, create uh, a sort of um, nation state in Italy, in a place that was for centuries only a sort of combination of different places with their own rulers, and suddenly at the end of the 19th uh, century, they thought, okay, then we should build a country, call it Italy, and the model to uh, make that country existing would be the nation state model. So there was a need also for voices and intellectuals uh, to produce as well the narrative, and that was the roots of the civic poetry. But after Gramsci in Italy in the 20s, and because Pasolini wrote this extraordinary um, series of poems called Ashes of Gramsci, he started rethinking the function of a civic poet. Could it be the opposite? Could it be the, 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 the place, a place or a site that is made for the voiceless? And also a form of right to address the civic body from a very specific position and a very singular position uh, that embodies that singularity, but at the same time that is able because it is addressed to a community to articulate a collective voice, but a collective voice that is still missing. Um, does it make sense? Yeah, yeah I, I, I think it does. So that's... <laughs> it does, it does make sense. That's basically what I had in mind when I started working on that piece. But in reality, it's something that you can see in, in all my works. They are all um, elaborate, uh, elaborated uh, around this idea of the civic poet, the anonymous civic poet that suddenly emerged and start articulating the potential collective works mm -hmm. that is still unheard, but, it, that, but that potentially exists or that can come into being. But you make it come into being. Like I was, I was watching those films this morning and I was getting chills because I felt like I was hearing a voice. Like it, there, was, there were voices filling in a void in, the, in terms of the discourse of this country. Mm -hmm. Like it was, it's actually, it was actually, um, I don't, I'm really grateful for the work. Uh, Thank you. I'm very actually, honored coming from you, it's uh, a great honor. Um, because it, it really, I just felt like I was hearing something that I needed to know existed and that, for some reason, as Americans, as like having the privilege of citizenship makes a certain kind of voice inaccessible, maybe willfully so. Maybe I'm just not listening or paying attention. But I had, I felt as if I was having access to something that it was being gifted to me, and that the the, the criticality of the individuals that you selected was stunning. Like it was just crystal. Well, and actually, they were not selected. Uh, no, <laughs> because there was no casting. Uh, How did you find meant. them? <laughs> That's a question I, I always ask. <laughs> because, but I, I, I understand why. But to me, it's always surprising to be kept asking the same question. Because I, I didn't find them. We met. Yeah. Uh, and somehow, um, 
the conversation we had was, uh, was basically about their own position. And what I found personally beautiful in what they articulated is the question of citizenship and civic belonging. Uh, and I think the key is, at some point, first when Conte starts to elaborate of what it means to be a citizen in this country, and then somehow Mahoma responds to him when he says, I became a citizen because my consciousness was here. And for me, it's the most beautiful definition of what, what it means to be a citizen. It's not a matter of paper uh, or administrative rules. It's about belonging to a community and being conscious of what it means to be a citizen. Yes, that's incredibly beautiful. That was incredibly beautiful. And I talk a lot about um, contemporary art can help us take a different lens or angle on, I think, the most critical topics we can address today. And I think what it means to be a citizen of any country or what it means to be belonging or think about even a collective voice and who's usually left out of our notion of a collective voice is something very powerful. So thank you. I think, Colleen, you do this as well in your own work. Um, does that resonate for you as something to chat about in terms of kind of moments when you feel that you're able to allow voices that perhaps haven't been heard before to be shared? I mean, I think it, uh, the position of African Americans is that we have like a, a tradition of, an oratory tradition, mm -hmm. a way of being heard, but we don't have a way of being seen because people decide how mm -hmm. to see us. So for me, it's always about how to make people see, see. I, I already, I feel like there's like, I, the language exists, exists. but somehow the, the, the language, what we know um, intellectually does not translate into the way I perceived or the way yes. other black people are perceived. Yes. So I'm very focused on the image or how to make an image that undermines certain ideas about what we are seeing or what we aren't seeing. Um, so it's a different, the stakes are yeah. the, like from that position are a little bit much more about the image and but even though I write manifestos all the time, yeah. so I was really into that. I'm always <laughs> trying to boss people around, but it's like much more in the work about the image. So. No, I think that's very powerful. Yeah, because well, what I also found extremely moving is the sort of very subtle uh, form of resistance that your piece suggests within the exhibition. And, it's, uh, and at the same time, it is immaterial. It's, it's just about being part uh, of a very specific site uh, with some minimal rules but that are more uh, like a form of invitation than uh, authoritative in, the, in what they propose. But in the fact that you also invite people to speak out, mm -hmm. the simple gesture of speaking becomes in itself a form of resistance mm -hmm. because there, there is a power in the speech um, that cannot, of course, replace let's say, articulated uh, militancy. Um, but it is also very much needed because it is also where it connects, it connects with the uh, powerful potential of resistance in poetry as well. Mm -hmm. It's basically where politics, let's say, and poetry meet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that, the, the text in that, I think you're talking about this broadsheet, this little newspaper um, that's printed and it's set in the center of this, the roundhouse which is down at 57th and Cottage Grove Avenue, when you should visit this architectural marvel. The building itself is a parabolic speaker. Yeah. It's a magical building that amplifies your voice, but just for you. So you feel amplified, even though your voice doesn't really affect others. Um, it's a magical building. And um, so the broadsheet has some instructions about how to get to know the building and what it can do and then it, and then if you're at a loss for words it has some poem like some words written by a poet some she called them um, mantras or affirmations and they're just very simple things to say out loud something that you might be willing to say to another person like kind kind things to say um, in case you're at for a loss of words so the idea there is I guess Using poetry, I mean, I didn't know there were there were no, there's no other kind of language that can do that. That can do that. Yeah. You know. So, can we talk a bit about 
the idea of the space between politics and art, or political art, or social activist art, or all the things that sometimes get termed onto practices like yours, or projects like this. Um, is it a useful thing at all? Do you feel that you're making art that's political? Do you feel that you're making art that is about the world you live in and you are a political member of the society and you can't help but make art about what feels important to you? And um, what is the balance point? Or is it, are there terms that feel like they put too much meaning on or become too didactic? Or do you feel that, you are, that art making is an activist form? <laughs> I mean, I, I am not an activist. Right. And I, I, is it possible to make something that isn't political? I don't know. I mean, that's like the question. You that's the question. Yeah. But I do think I do make a distinction between the like the practice of politics and the practice of art. I yes. think they are different different jobs. They are different objectives. And I am my objective is is to not sort of coerce or co convince or amass power, which is what politics does. Mm -hmm. My objective is this individual. Like you and you and you might encounter this and might have an experience, and and that might lead to a stabilization of like just for even if it's just for a moment. I think I make that distinction, and I'm very committed to that very small, insignificant intervention into the interchange between you and you and you and me, and me um, as opposed to. What's really necessary, another kind of work, which is political work, which yeah. is necessary and essential, but it can't happen unless we are awake or are conscious. And that, that so I'm just doing my, this part of it, and, and I'm trying to make it difficult for the politicians to use, quite honestly, yes. like it's dangerous. Like if you make something that's useful to a politician, then it's, that's you've made a weapon. Yes, I totally agree with that. And I think we were just talking earlier about why I really love university museums. And I think it is very much because there it is a space of inquiry and attempt to impact and sort of like a seminar in a classroom to think about things from different points of view. And that's very much my own mission is to hope that we create a space for conversation and that artistic practice will just potentially shift a perspective even if it's just for a moment. And to me, the really greatest, what we would call political art, isn't political art. It isn't something that is didactic and can be used, as you so beautifully said, as a weapon or for a very articulated purpose. So I think that was a wonderful, wonderful way of describing it. So thank you. I'm going to turn the same question to you. Um, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, to the point that I'm, I'm not even sure that I'm a Nazi statue. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I'm, it's quite difficult to explain what I do exactly. Um, but I like doing it. Yeah. Um, and I was also very often asked, why I, am I not a filmmaker in the traditional meaning ah, of it? Yes, of course. Uh, and I think the answer was maybe because when I started producing artworks, I found that art was a more open space and a more free space that there was more freedom mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in art that I could find in filmmaking. Yes. Uh, and this has also to do with the production system of making films. Production film. system, yeah. Uh, Asking permission. Yes. Or having people who yeah. are expecting to and recoup some kind of costs. And yeah, like and it demands a lot of courage yes. to work within an industry yes. and to achieve uh, something because it's, ex it's extremely yeah. difficult. And uh, the, the various agenda of the people who are trying to put pressure on you to make sure that you won't do exactly what you want to do yeah. is enormous. Yes. In art, I was free. I didn't. Uh, I didn't have to ask permission. No one's paying attention. Exactly. And I could do whatever I wanted and until they pay attention, it. and then it's very powerful. But to go back to the core of your question, I'm not even sure that there is something that can be defined as political right. I mean, there is a history of political art sure. that is closely linked to propaganda. That's something, yes, else. something else. That's another conversation. But I think that uh, when suddenly uh, artists start to be labeled as political artists, it's because maybe there is a limit that was reached, reached in, the, in, in the wording or for describing what they do. So suddenly you start uh, calling them political artists because you don't know how to define that practice yes. exactly. What is it exactly about? 
Um, so maybe there are also words missing to describe certain type of practice. I agree with that. Or maybe it's just because the space of art is also opening up to something different, and it's also evolving. I mean, I, I, that's, I was just thinking, I mean, the, the political art is art made by people who are paying attention to the world. To the world. And it, it's kind of astounding that that would be confusing. And right. that suddenly that would cease to be art. Theoretically, that's, that's what that artists have been doing. Perfect. Category, yeah. Well, that's really well said, and I think that, and I really asked the question because it's something that really like, kind of makes me feel uncomfortable a lot of the time when people are talking too much or saying, oh, this exhibition is so much about political art. It's really about the world, right? Mm -hmm. These are the things that surround us, and artists, and we all live in the same world and read the same newspapers and have the same, don't have the same reactions to them, but have our own individually driven reactions to them. So let's talk, let's shift for a second and just talk about, um, since we're talking about place, one of the kind of things that has really taken place in this global contemporary art world that we pay a lot of attention to is biennials, art fairs, um, <laughs> art festivals, things like that. And both of you have been part of a few recently, the Whitney Biennial Documenta, here at the Palais de Tokyo project at the DuSable Roundhouse um, as part of an art fair in some ways. And I think art fairs are getting much more complicated in important ways and questioning things like the market. But I want to ask, from, me, from where you sit, how useful are the biennials? Or how much do they give you impetus to make work or a moment to see yourselves in context, to be in dialogues like this? Um, so much is being talked about about the kind of perva pervasiveness of the biennial model or the fair model. How do you feel about that? Or how, how has being part of them been useful? Or has it not been? Yeah. <laughs> you were part of that. Um, as I was saying before, often exhibitions for me are opportunities to produce artwork yeah. that I was willing to produce for many years. Yeah. And it's actually the case even for Documenta. Yeah. Because the, the, the work that I'm showing, or that I was showing in Athens and Kessel, was actually a project that I started developing six years ago. At that time, there was no Documenta in Athens in, into question. Um, so it was really about the opportunity, to finally have the opportunity to produce something I was uh, thinking of and reflecting on and researching for literally years. Um, so that's more the way I, I actually see it. Yeah. Like, it is the time, it is the opportunity. Um, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm also maybe very lucky mm -hmm. because I was often invited by creators that I respect a lot yes. and that show a lot of respect to the, to the work and to the artist's work. Very important. Absolutely important because it's actually the, one of the basis of the collaboration. Yes. Because it's also above all a dialogue. It's a dialogue. Yeah. And a dialogue without respect is not a dialogue. It's an authoritative statement, so that's also the, that's maybe why I'm also very lucky. Yeah. It's the kind of collaboration I, I actually often had. What have been your processes for um, accepting an invitation to be part of a document, let's say? If someone, an odd curator that you know well, or someone comes and you sit and there feels like there's a real connection of an understanding of intention, and then you're willing to move uh, forward? I didn't know the curator who extended the invitation. Uh, we had a conversation in Berlin. Yeah. Um, that was not very long, but that was very important. Yes. Because I, I could talk about the project I was uh, working on that was connecting Athens with another story that happened elsewhere, yes. but that resonates, or both resonate with, uh, with each other. I mean, it was very simple and very natural. It was a conversation. Yes. Uh, basically. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? How? You know, I, this is new, new for me, and um, I think international biennials for me, or maybe a lot of American artists, are really important because getting off this continent yeah. can be really difficult, particularly depending on who you are and what kind of work you do. There are like various kinds of ways in which certain kinds of work. Is it's assumed that it will have currency around the world, and then other kinds of work, it's assumed that it won't. Yes. And so I think it's really crucial to try and find ways to to make 
work travel off this continent mm -hmm. and find its way where it needs to go, you know. And the bi the international biennials are a way for that to happen. And then American biennials are I think of as like the prom. The prom like, yeah, like the Whitney like Biennial. Biennial. Yeah. It's like the prom. And it's just fun that you get invited. Yeah, you know, it's like you're the freshman and the senior asks you out. Yeah, yeah it's like, totally awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, kind of a perfect way to perfect way. And that and that was sort of why I started with talking about my like long-standing idea, unfully formed, or this idea of does place matter, and it had a great deal to do with kind of the way we think we understand work, because we come from the same place as that artist, or we think we know from news media about what that place is like, and that as you get out into the world and you share more dialogues, it's a much more complicated story, of course, and so like in its best case scenario, I agree that international biennials do that. Yeah, but maybe also the all this debate around the uh, multiplication of binaries is also that many of them, or new ones, are happening in places that were not on the contemporary art world map before, mm -hmm. uh, like Dakar or yes. Bamako yes. or even Sharjah, yeah. uh, that has become an extremely important place yes. in the in the Middle East for the the reflection on contemporary art and its meaning and, and resonance. Um, so maybe the question is asked now because there are all those places that are somehow competing with yes. older and Westerner yes. events. Yeah. Decentering, which exactly. is decentering is really important. Yeah. Exactly. And Sharjah, I think, has been one of the most interesting biennials of any over the last several or however many years apart it happens. Is it? It's a biennial. 15, 20 years. Yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been incredibly interesting. Yeah, I think it's something worth worth really thinking about. Oh, that yeah. Or Dakar, Dakar, which Dakar is extremely yes. important. Extremely important. But then I for photography, extremely important too. And there are all those places where, as well, artists who don't have necessarily the chance to travel yes. can see artworks by their colleagues from literally over the world, yes. also showing their work, yes. entering into conversation with the artists invited, yes. the curators invited. Yes. It's extremely important for the for the uh, communities of artists in all those different places yes. to be part of the conversation and also to be the center from where the conversation can start. Absolutely. Absolutely, because in those places where there's not perhaps a strong gallery system, these artists are not... Even art schools. Or even art schools. Or like like in Morocco, they are too. No, it's an incredible thing, and I think that that does feel very important when we think about what does it really mean to think of a global art world. It's not just about galleries from the countries we know well coming together to sell art, although that's important as well. Um, but I think you're getting at something really, really interesting. Um, I'm gonna check our time because I wanna make sure we have some time for questions. Um, are there other things that the two of you really felt like you wanted to say about your experience of being part of this exhibition? Um, what did it feel like to be invited to be part of this, and how did that feel like it drove or perhaps extended a possibility for your practice in a different way? I, I, I was really, I really enjoyed emailing back and forth with Katel because um, she has a really light touch with how she asked you to think about making work, you know? Yeah. So she just said, well, just go see the site, which I'd already, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I'd, um, when I first moved to Chicago, I just got very lucky and snuck into a tour of the Roundhouse six years ago. It's an amazing place. And, and it still smelled like hay, uh -huh. and, 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 it, and it was, it's just a glorious building, and at that moment, I was like, I really, one day, I just really want to something yourself. to happen here, yeah. yeah. So, um, when Katel and I sat down and spoke, and I didn't know that it was she was thinking about the roundhouse. I had no idea. Um, so it was just these really gentle nudges from her about how to think about like visiting the site, which I already I knew the site, and then like what could happen or what might happen, and um, and and also really inviting me. I think maybe with the American artist, she encouraged us to think about a relationship with. France and right now there are a lot of echoes across the ocean yes. in political stakes yes. and what's happening and what's what's being expressed in the citizenry mm -hmm. and um, I mean I, it was just actually really pleasurable to be having a, that kind of conversation sort of like a friendly conversation about like what's at stake with this convergence yeah. and then what's at stake in this particular neighborhood so I feel like it's really important to to say about Palais de Tokyo about doing this project in that site is that if 
I, I don't know how much longer it would have taken for that site to be open. Yes. And it, I live a mile and a half away from that building, and I ride my bike by it all the time. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, it was really wonderful Tuesday night to see the opening and to see people who also live in that neighborhood see this space in this way um, delivered and presented with such care yes. uh, and respect. And, um, and it that's was about really, the power really, yeah, yeah. And that's just, yes. yeah. It's not so much about, you know, if, 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 I, if I hadn't had the privilege of being in the show, I would have been there that night, like doing cartwheels through yeah. the space because <laughs> it was just so beautiful and exciting to see it so so wonderfully rendered for the yes. community that lives there. And then the, the rest of the city, too, coming yes. and seeing that this, this magical building, and you I, know. Yeah. So. I totally agree. And I would say that in its best case, scenario sometimes artists and art events can bring to life parts of the city in a way that it feels very important. Artists have been doing this for ever, in fact. Um, so it's an incredible space um, and it's it's deeply about the architecture when you experience the exhibition as well. It's hard to find the two that the works in that space and the space itself not to be kind of inextricably linked to the effect that they're having upon the reception. Well, um, I think the most important intervention was besides that it was not an intervention. Yes. Um, there was a sort of organic dialogue with the building as it is. Uh, and what was quite nice is that they didn't try to turn it into a sort of Kunsthand or an exhibition space. It is exactly. really about works yeah, yeah. being shown there and entering into dialogue with the place as it is, its architecture, but yeah. also the location where it is situated. Yes. And hopefully, with all the community that lives around it. Um, I mean, when Catherine invited me, I, I actually had the chance already to work with her uh, two oh. years before, because she was the creator of, yeah, yeah. of my solo at Palette Tokyo. Um, and it was such a beautiful collaboration, absolutely based on respect. And that's uh, actually what I liked a lot about working with yeah. Catherine. Um, she really understands the work, but she also really understands how an artist install a work or hang a work yeah. or try to articulate works with a specific location. And because I know her very um, deep interest in spaces and exhibition spaces and how artists work with the space, and because at that time I knew that it would be at the round house, so I made a bit of homework to, yeah. to see exactly what it, where it was, I, I felt this would be interesting. Yes. Because um, it's normally not the space that, let's say, a foreign curator would pick up in Chicago <laughs> to create a show, yeah. but they went for that one, and that was a brilliant idea. It's a brilliant idea. idea, absolutely brilliant idea. Um, and it feels so important to me as a sort of new transplant to the University of Chicago, also very close on the south side. Um, we are going to stop for just a minute. Um, I want to just, before we turn to the audience, I want to just thank both of you for jumping into the unknown with me and talking in such a beautiful way about things that I kind of thought maybe were there and they and you made them so much more complicated and lovely and important than I even imagined. So thanks so much to both of you for doing this with me. I'm really Thank grateful. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. We have time for a question. We have time for a question. 15 minutes. 15 minutes we have time for some questions. All right, let's go right here. Can we possibly bring the lights up on the audience a little bit? Thank you. Oh, we might get you a mic. Oh, do you want to? Uh, oh, I do. <laughs> so, um, something personally that uh, I've encountered when uh, speaking or giving a voice to the narratives of, of the disenfranchised and the choices in being mindful of counter narratives and or undermining certain areas as you spoke as you as you mentioned earlier are also surrounding the possibility of creating weapons of, of your choice in editing. Do you ever find uh, like a struggle when finding out where on that continuum you want to be as opposed to the the authenticity of the stories that you're telling and being mindful of where it might be on that spectrum of undermining a narrative or giving voice to it or possible I don't know if any of this is making any sense but I just say focus on who I want to see it. Like, who is it for? Like, who do I imagine seeing it? 
sometimes I'm, I mean, I've grown to, I've, I've, for a long time, imagined that my, my audiences are in, the, are in the future, like I haven't met them yet. I'm just trying to make work for that, and that makes it kind of useful, useless for like a kind of contemporary political discourse where the objective would be to galvanize and mobilize and, and have people move in mass. I don't, I don't really worry about that. And I mean, if, if, if I ever made something that suddenly became useful to a, a certain kind of political agenda, even one that I agree with, then I think that's just something you really have to learn from, right? Like, um, and I, I, I haven't, I mean, no one's really paying that much attention. <laughs> so I'm not really a concern. Um, so, yeah. Great. Can we get into the thread here? It was really cool listening to all of you guys talk. You're all just really smart women in like great places in your career, and you made this space comfortable. Uh, so just as a student, I was just impressed with how well researched uh, all of you are. So, what are you reading right now? <laughs> I read a lot about these two this morning. <laughs> or what should I read as a art history student? Uh, uh, I actually read a lot of many different things, but I, 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 I like it. Now I'm, I'm going back to Jean Genet, uh, the French writer and poet, but I'm also reading other things that have nothing to do with Jean Genet, but I see connections between those things, and that's basically... It's, it, actually, your question is beautiful and, and, and a very good one. Because <laughs> um, a huge part of my work is actually spending a lot of time somewhere and reading a lot of stuff, and very different stuff. And, s and suddenly, co connections start to, um, um, or a sort of dialogue between all those things uh, uh, starts. So it, makes, it, it is really made of very, very, very different things. It is true that research is extremely important within my practice. But at the same time, to be honest, the fact that I spend a lot of time reading things makes me also more quiet and confident because then I don't need to worry about what I would be doing. You know, I'm busy with doing all those things. So I, I, I don't have that, uh, I mean, what the French call l'angoisse de la passe blanche, like that fear of the, of the, of the void. <laughs> that, uh, that is always also an experience of producing an artwork. So it keeps you busy and it's good to be busy and not to be feared or anxious about producing a work. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, um, I was doing a project in Toronto that took about two years unexpectedly to resolve. And when I first showed up in Canada, the black Canadian artists were really angry. And we're just like, you Americans are so ignorant. And I was like, you are so right. Because it's like a, a parallel universe. And we just, it's familiar enough that you can roll into Canada and just feel like you know what's going on there. And there is this, this vast, vast wealth of uh, Caribbean Canadian um, poets that I didn't know very much about. Like I heard their names and I never, I, I didn't sit down to read them. And so I, I just, I went home and I just started reading about the Caribbean, which then I realized is really crucial to Americans to understand this relationship, our contemporary colonial relationship to the Caribbean and what we're doing and what we're not doing and what we've done and the consequences of that. And I just didn't know. And it just sort of, I, and I, I mean, it's kind of, I love that about reading. I mean, like when you're just reading and you're just feeling more and more ignorant as you read, mm -hmm. you're just like, I am an idiot. And just mm -hmm. keep turning the pages, like hoping to, like hoping for knowledge as an antidote. So. That was my, but I mean, just read what, read what you're curious about, mm -hmm. read what you don't know about. I was just curious what you're, you're yeah. curious. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Layla. Um, I actually uh, came here from St. Louis to see this. Um, this is a very stimulating conversation. It really reflects on like what I'm doing in my own uh, practice as an artist. I'm focusing on identity as well. Uh, this question goes to uh, mainly the Bushra. Um, so my question is, uh, so you're from Morocco. So, well, you say Casablanca is from Morocco. So Morocco is in the African continent. But then it's also associated with being the Middle East. So uh, 
with that, do you define being African and Middle Eastern? Or you get you get asked this a lot often. Um, I'm very curious to know like what I don't know how you identify or how you merge those two I guess con or regions. Actually, your question is is as, as much about geography, geopolitics, and therefore history. <laughs> but I ended up answering the question for myself, saying that I'm a Creole, uh, because the history of Morocco is so complex, um, and it cannot be defined by uh, the belonging to the African continent or the great, the so-called great Middle East. The fact is that Morocco is an extraordinary combination of people from various cultural backgrounds. The importance of Amazigh culture, uh, Arabic culture, uh, Jewish heritage, the immediate connection to the European continent. Uh, I mean, all of this is so strong and exists so powerfully in the language itself because my mother tongue is Moroccan Arabic and Ar Moroccan Arabic is not Arabic. It's basically a sort of Creole that is in itself um, an extraordinary combination of uh, Arabic, Amazigh languages, uh, French, uh, Spanish uh, in the north of Morocco, and now even English in Casablanca. <laughs> because, um, it's a sort of dynamic um, that is incorporated in, within the language itself. So now I feel uh, very comfortable saying I am a Creole, because that's basically what the country I come from is about. Uh, it's not an Arab country, it's not an African country, it's many different things all together. And, and that's, I would say, the, somehow the basics of our identity. And I find it also important to say it that way because it's also a response to nationalistic conception of belonging and citizenship. And um, saying that you belong to a queer area is also about saying that there is, following what uh, Edouard Lisson was defining as a sort of large creolization. It is a movement of the world itself. And this exists in Morocco and in many different places. And it's probably not by chance if my work is also strongly connected to, um, as an example, the history of movement of independence in what, that, what was called at that time the third world, because it was paradoxically also a sort of creolization movement. Because the people were meeting, they were exchanging ideas, they were supporting each other. They were also inventing a sort of language to relate to each other. And it was completely rethinking the geography um, uh, and the idea of belonging that was anyway strongly connected to the colonial history. So emancipation has also uh, to be a, a sort of emancipation of the conception of what is geography and therefore what is belonging. Um, so that's why I, I, I actually say I'm a creole. As simple as that. Good question and good answer. Absolutely, very good. Question. Thank you. One more question. Right here. I guess my question is also kind of directed toward Bushra too. Um, I'm recently interested in the idea of agency in art making, and um, and you were talking about civic poets, which I think is a very beautiful idea, and just wondering, like, uh, from your perspective per se, uh, what's your, um, what do you see as agency for civic poets? Um, in your video. It might be pretty self evident in your video, but that hasn't seen yet. So just wondering if you could maybe talk about it a little bit. And also the agency of the video to yourself as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, it's a very good question too, but I'm not sure if I actually can answer it. Because if I was answering it, uh, it would mean that um, I produce that series of work, thinking that they can be useful, or that, that, that they can be used. Um, and that's not the way I develop projects. I, I rather see the connection between an artwork, a site, and viewers as a series of potentialities, of things that can become possible. It doesn't mean that they will happen, but it's essentially a proposal that I'm extending or making. Uh, and going back to, the, to, the, to that Pasolinian conception of the civic poet, I think it can be even extended to an art space. An art space can be also a civic space, depending on the proposals that are made there, mm -hmm. and depending also on the dialogue that viewers can have uh, with artworks. So it's, it's more a sort of proposal 
and individuals react to it. It can have no uh, impact at all, or it can also uh, come that, and it's actually what you were saying before, um, viewers and individuals experiencing the work, shifting their perspective, or at least starting the same thing maybe differently. Maybe it won't change the world, and probably it won't change the world, uh, but at least it can suggest other perspectives. Um, and that's, I think, also what, what an art space is about, uh, producing those p possibilities of new perspective or other perspectives uh, that can be met by um, viewers within that context. I, I hope I answered your question. Maybe one last question if we've got one. All right, otherwise I have, I must remind all of you that if you can, you can find a flyer near you. We are having a fantastic party in collaboration with Expo, the official closing party for Expo at the Smart Museum tonight called Revolution Every Night. You can come and see a wonderful work by Colleen Smith in our featured exhibition, Revolution Every Day. Um, we're featuring performances from La Stampa and food, and it starts at 8, and it is, we are all exhausted, so it should just be fun. So I hope you see us, we see you at the Smart Museum. I hope you see us at the Smart Museum. Um, and again, I just can't thank the two of you enough for doing this with me. So thanks so much. <laughs>